Hi, welcome to another Now Playing vlog where I talk about some of the games I've been playing lately and what I think of them. The games in this video were voted on by my Patreon backers. If you'd like to help Actualol grow bigger and better, go to patreon.com forward slash Actualol. There are links to all the games mentioned in the description below. Let's get on with it. Mountains of Madness was a game that I was really excited about at Essen. This is a party game from Rob Davio that has a horror HP Lovecraft theme where you are going up a mountain and you're going mad along the way. It's a cooperative game and you are trying to complete these little missions by playing the right numbered cards together collaboratively. But the way you communicate is hindered by these madnesses that affect you. So you will be given madness cards that tell you certain ways you can communicate. So you might have to close your eyes. You might be able to only talk in a certain way or only talk to a certain player. And that is really making it difficult for you to communicate in a timed phase. You're having to rush to try and get everything done. And that's what appealed to me about the game. And it's certainly the best bit about the game. It's wonderfully thematic. It really fits the, the idea of going mad. And yet it didn't always work when we were playing the games. The first time we played Mountains of Madness, and then it ended up being quite boring. The Madness cards that we got weren't that interesting. I had a level three card where I just had to tap my fingers on the table whilst I was communicating, which didn't cause any problems for me. It, it, that doesn't affect my communication at all. It, it made the game far too easy for me. And you keep your Madness cards often for a long time without anything really changing. So the next time I played it, I really wanted to have a good experience. And so I rigged the deck and I went through and I took out Madness cards that sounded boring because they were boring. And we had a great time. And I was in tears of laughter during those time phases because we were ending up one person's blind and someone's having to rhyme all their answers and someone's having to um, count out numbers by using the months of the year. And you just have no idea what's going on and it's calamitous and that's the best part of this game but there's just not enough of it we also played the variant in the back of the rule book where our madness is stacked so um you get a level one madness and instead of getting rid of that when you get a level two you add your level two and your level three because some of them don't really work together so at its best this game is hilarious and i'm amazed that i would get rid of a game that had me in tears of laughter because for me that is kind of the pinnacle of where games are. Me and my friends laughing, having an amazing time, that is what I love in a party game. But there's so much else to the game that I just don't feel is that necessary. You've got this huge board, it's a big box, there's just a few too many rules and extra things that aren't needed. What you really just need is a game, a super simple card game that requires you to play some cards in some way or other and then the madnesses, and nothing else is required. No other rules about um, th these, there's these poker chips in the game that allow you to, when you make certain mistakes and things like that. And it's just, it's just fluff that it detracts from it. And I would love to see Mountains of Madness, the card game that just focuses on the core gameplay and the right types of madnesses. And so actually coming away from this game, it made me want to design my own game. I talked about it in my collection video. Um, there's a game called Fast Food Fear that I'm, I'm thinking about trying to come up with my own sort of house ruled expansion and add madnesses to that game. Um, so I think it's, I, I wanna see the games that are inspired by Mountains of Madness. Um, the timed phase was certainly a lot of fun. It shouldn't be a sand timer, it should be an alarm because it's way too easy to cheat in this game. It's so easy to be like, oh yeah, I was just about to do that, or oh, ah, well, we made an accident. It's one of those real-time cooperative games that can kind of fall down by people just wanting to break the rules and oh, just sneaking past. Um, but it's, there's some fun to be had. I think it's um, an interesting idea, but it's, it's just not perfect. That's Mountains of Madness. Corporate America Gilded Edition is a new version of Corporate America, which is a game from a few years ago that I really loved. This is a light negotiation game with a really nice, lighthearted, funny theme where you're trying to be an evil corporation 
making the most money in America. And the way you do that is by building businesses. They're represented by cards and they are in certain industries. So you might have a film studio that is in the sin industry, or you might have a taco truck in the food industry. And every round, you're gonna be flipping over these consumer cards that dictate what the American people are consuming in that era. So if you flip over a card that says energy, then everyone with energy businesses in, in that industry, they are gonna cash in a whole bunch of money. So you've bought these businesses and then they pay out money when people consume those industries. But the interesting thing is, is that you can push your luck. You can pay the game to flip over another card because maybe you don't like the first card that you flipped. And so you want to try and get the industry that you've really got loads of businesses in. So you pay to flip it over. It doesn't come up. Maybe you pay and flip over another one. And then you decide between the industries that have been flipped, which one's gonna pay out for that round. And that's where the negotiation and bribery come in because the other players are trying to pay you to pick the card that they want, the one that's gonna make them the most money. So maybe they'll offer to share their winnings with you, or um, maybe they'll help you flip over another card. They'll give you the money towards doing that because they really don't like what's available. It's not making them any money. It's such a simple idea that makes for so much negotiation. That's one of the great things about corporate America is that it's so easy to get into rules-wise and yet there's so much scope for ne negotiation and bribery at all points. You've got a handful of money, you immediately know what to do with it. You, you're playing the game for 10 minutes and you understand, okay, this is what I have, this is what I need, more money, and this is how I'm gonna get it by trying to persuade people to do things my way. Of course, you don't wanna to spend too much of your money on bribery because that's how you win the game. You win by having the most money. So you don't wanna you, you don't want to fall into the trap of paying the game loads to flip over the right card, flip over the right card. That's costing you so much money and you, but you, and you're trying to, obviously you're trying to then get the big payout, but what if you never get it? Or what if you pay so much for it that it wasn't worth it? So that is the, the main idea of how you make money in the game. But there's also legislations that get brought in. So they will be flipped over and they will do things like tax certain industries. So the Christians might want sin industries taxed. And if that legislation gets passed, then all businesses that are part of that industry are now gonna be losing money. So there's always good legislations and bad ones, and some will be good for you, some you won't care about, but they'll be really bad for other players. And the person who picks which legislations get passed is the president. And so every round you will vote on a new president. How do you vote on a president in America? Well, you do it with money. So you are taking it in turns as a few rounds of bidding where you're secretly putting money cards in front of your the candidate that you want to vote for. But, but of course, nobody knows how much everyone's putting in, then they all get revealed. The person with the most money in front of them becomes the president. All of that money gets wasted. So you see people wasting loads of money just to make themselves president. Was it worth it? Well, they get to control some of the economy with the legislations they passed. They get passed because some of them give big payouts or attack other players. And they also get to revoke a law from a previous round. They also get an executive privilege card. These are super powerful one-off cards that they will just use and it will influence the game, game uh, change the game in some way that hopefully was worth it. So that's another reason that people really want to become the president. And that's the whole game. You uh, do that a few rounds, so you, you buy a few extra businesses, try and get them to pay out, and it's just so much negotiation. I love negotiation games, and Corporate America is a brilliant one because it has a, such a simple rule system and quite a short playtime and just allows you to be throwing money around at each other and trying to convince people around to your way of thinking. And that's what negotiation games are about. So I think it will be a wonderful introduction to negotiation games uh, to people. But if you, if you like negotiation games at all, or if you like this wonderful theme, um, it's political satire, but very light, very just humorous, and it's done really nicely, 
I'm giving corporate America a seal of actual love. It's such an immediate, rich negotiation game. And this Gilded Edition just makes it even better. It shortens it and streamlines it. The game was a little bit long before, but now it's just the right length, about three rounds, about an hour and a half to two hours, if you really get into the negotiation, possibly a bit shorter than that. And it's not as mean as some negotiation games. There isn't really much take that in it. It's very much about trying to persuade people, use money to get things to your round to your way rather than a lot of attacking and, and people feeling really kind of maligned because they've been um, attacked. So it, it's quite a positive negotiation game in that respect. And I'm, I'm a di bit disappointed by how under the radar this game is because... I love it. I think it's wonderful. And yet I don't hear a lot of chat about it. It's really only Dan King, the Game Boy Geek, the person I heard about it uh, from, who talks about it. And I think it deserves a lot more attention. So maybe the artwork or the theme isn't that interesting to you. Don't let that put you off. It's a wonderful negotiation game and one that I'd highly recommend. That's Corporate America Gilded Edition. Flip Ships is a dexterity game where you're working together against the game. These aliens are attacking your city and you have to destroy them. It's a bit like Space Invaders. And the way you destroy them is by flicking these cardboard discs off the edge of the table, hopefully onto these aliens that are attacking you and also trying to get them into their mothership. So you have to destroy the aliens that are coming down. They're represented by cards. And then their mothership, which is this construction made of cardboard, you have to try and get them in there, kind of like a basketball hoop or something like that. And when I first played this game, I found it impossible. In fact, we all did. And the trouble was, was we were playing, we were flicking with our thumb. We thought that was the best way. And I actually t tweeted about it and the designer, Kane Klenko, very kindly uh, commented and gave us some tips on how to be better at the game. Played it again and we were immediately so much better. So um, that is, uh, if you play the game, you, the way to do it is to flick with your um, middle finger against your thumb and uh, and that will get you the most power and accuracy. And so when I played the second time, I actually did really well. Managed to get it in the mothership like twice in a row. I pulled off some amazing shots. And Flip Ships is a fun game. I like the idea of working together on a dexterity game. It reminds me of a game that I love called Dungeon Fighter where you're rolling dice onto a board to try and um, win battles in a dungeon. Uh, in that game, there's a lot of funny, silly challenges to it where you might have to do it with your eyes closed or spin around. There's different ways to throw those dice. In Flip Ships, it's more of a tactical game. Um, the, the decisions you make, which aliens to attack, maybe sometimes you'll take the hit because it's only as you get depleted that the game allows you to have more ships that you can flick. And so there's a little bit of a balance there. You kind of want to step, uh, kind of fly a bit too close to the sun to be rewarded by the game to be able to then win it because you're more powerful. And so there's quite a lot of interesting decisions um, as to which aliens to attack. Um, some of them work together. Some of them allow a force field on another alien ship. So you have to attack that one first. There's maybe tactics about who should do which thing because one player is better than the other. And so I've, I found there was interesting thought to the decisions you're making and that made it quite a different dexterity game to Dungeon Fighter. And yet for me, it didn't make it a, a better, more fun one. I personally prefer the silliness, the, the extra element of hilarity that Dungeon Fighter brings, whereas I could totally understand that people would want the tactics and strategy that Flip Ships, Flip Ships provides. Um, and so it's a really lovely production, amazing artwork from Quan Chai Moria. It's quite a modest sized box and it does something completely different to any other dexterity game out there. And it's one of very few cooperative dexterity games. So I've had a blast with Flip Ships. I, I would recommend it to anyone who likes the sound of it. But for me, it wasn't quite enough to stay in my collection and I just slightly prefer Dungeon Fighter for the, the silly, chaotic um, experience. That's Flip Ships. Rescue Polar Bears Data and Temperature was a game that I was really excited about from Essen. This is a cooperative game from Taiwan with a really wonderful theme about trying to rescue polar bears in the North Pole, but also trying to collect 
data about climate change to send back to the government to, so that your government will take action on climate change. That's a theme that really interests me, certainly very different to any other board game. And I was excited to see that in a board game, especially a cooperative one, because I tend to like cooperative games. And the game has a really nice production to it because it has these wonderfully cute polar bear meeples. Really, really, really nice, really cute. Um, and there's loads of them in the game. And they are on these ice hexagons and sinking into the ocean. And you desperately want to save them. Unfortunately, the game didn't meet my expectations. I found it to be quite boring. Um, I felt like the decisions in the game were quite straightforward. You really just rescuing, you're going to rescue the most obvious polar bear. Basically one ice hex for that at the moment is on the verge of melting. And so you're generally gonna go and rescue the polar bears from there and you have to take them back to your base. In that respect, it's a bit like Flashpoint Fire Rescue. And then the other aspect of the game, the collecting the data tokens, is just nothing. You just drive to a spot where it is and you immediately pick it up. And then you drive to another spot and pick that up and drive to another spot. And you have to pick up like 20 of these tokens, I think, or 15. And there's nothing, there's, there's no kind of clever moves in this game. You really are just doing the most obvious thing and then hoping that it, the game goes well for you because there is also quite a lot of luck. At the end of each round, you roll a dice and it, depending on which tile it affects, the, the, then the polar bears breed. That's quite a nice mechanism, the way the polar bears breed. If there's a mummy and a daddy, then they create babies. And so they're, they're populating and the more there is, they, they will start to sink because there's just too many of them and so they will start to die and then that's one of the ways you can lose the game is by having too many polar bears die. So it, it just felt like every turn there was always an obvious move and that's never interesting in a cooperative game. What are the decisions that we can discuss with each other? The other problem I had with the game is there's just so much admin involved. So at the end of every round you roll a dice, then you have to see which hex that corresponds to because there's no pattern to the board so you're always trying to find the right hex then you have to work out whether the polar bears on that hex are going to breed or whether they're going to, their babies are going to grow up. Then if they breed, the polar bears have to maybe flee onto adjacent tiles or they're going to sink and you have to deal with that. Then you have to roll the temperature die. Then the temperature goes up. Then you have, generally, you, you hit the alert temperature and so the, the tile that is melting is going to melt, so then you have to deal with the polar bears on there. Are they going to flee or are they going to die? And then you have to spend a helicopter token, which is effectively like a life. And you do that at the end of every single person's turn. And it just, it just felt like too much work. And again, a bit reminiscent of Flashpoint Fire Rescue, another game that I would say has a little bit too much admin to it that isn't straightforward, that requires a bit too much concentration every single turn. Um, and so you, you just never feel like you can get on top of it. The game is certainly hard. The polar bears are constantly breeding. You, you never feel like you're under control. And then these ice tiles are constantly melting, but it just feels random. The one that gets assigned, will you be able to cope with it or not? Well, they just come out at random. So you have no way of preparing. Okay, let's say this one is gonna melt and you've got no chance of saving the polar bears on it. So it would be nice to be able to look ahead, much like you would do in Pandemic or something like that. You plan for, for alternatives. You can't do that in this game because it's just going to come out at random. And so uh, we found the gameplay in Rescue Polar Bears to not be interesting. There wasn't any way to plan. There wasn't really any use for any discussion. So while some of the theme works quite nicely, other bits doesn't really make any sense. One of the ways that you can try and lower the temperature is by breaking up the ice, which is completely unthematic. There are some clever ideas, having to try and keep male and female polar bears separate so they won't breed, things like that. And I certainly like the production and it's simple enough rules-wise, but the gameplay just didn't do it for us. Um, it, this one was a big disappointment, I'm sorry to say. That's Rescue Polar Bears, Data and Temperature. Zoo Ball is a dexterity game from Osprey Games. This comes with its own playmat, which is like a Sabutio field, a green um, tablecloth, and 
a bunch of wooden discs that you flick across it and they flick really nicely. The mat works well. It, it has creases in it because it folds into the box, but it, um, it's very smooth and the uh, wooden discs slide across it really nicely. The game is very simple. You are really just trying to get your um, attackers in the goal area of your opponent. So on your turn, you can decide, do you flick your one attacker piece or do you flick your three defenders? So your defenders are obviously used to block and try and flick your opponent off the board, get into places so your their attacker can't get into your goal. Your attacker is the way you get points to win the game. And that's it. That's the whole game. There's no special abilities. There's no extra rules or uh, really different variants. Um, you can play it two and four players. And I just found it a bit disappointing in that respect. It's certainly fun for a bit, flicking the discs. They flick really nicely, but there wasn't enough game there to bring me back in. I'd heard that the team variant, or well, not team variant, the four player variant was more interesting because you've got four players and you basically got goals in the corner and you're trying to get into your opposing goal. But I actually just found that you were constantly having to bash the leader because one person was really close to scoring, well, they're gonna win the game. So you have to stop, rather than trying to win the game yourself, which you're maybe quite far away, you have to stop them from winning the game. Then maybe someone else is ahead. So then it, it just goes around, you're kind of just stopping other people from winning. That's how it, it played out for us anyway. But I could, Imagine kids quite liking this one, certainly super simple to play with non-gamers, but I think there are a lot of better dexterity games out there that have just a few extra rules and a bit more entertainment factor for me, and so Zubal didn't quite hit the spot. Those were some of the games I've been playing lately. I've put links to where you can buy all of them in the description below. If you like this video and you want to see more in this series, then please subscribe to the channel. And if you want to help the channel grow bigger and better, go to patreon.com forward slash actual I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.